If Jesus showed up to your house, what would he find? Because this was going to be John the Baptist's job, to prepare people for the arrival of Jesus. But what does that actually look like? Because we've heard John talk about repentance and baptism, but what we're going to learn is that both of those things should be producing a change in our life, an inward change that actually changes our outward actions. Join us today as we continue in Luke. All right, good morning. Welcome to our Luke series. Um, last week, we talked about how John the Baptist has now shown up on the scene, and it's going to be his job to prepare the way for Jesus. Um, he's out in the wilderness. He's baptizing for the repentance of sin. But as we've been talking about, this would have been a foreign concept to the Jews. So, this is John the Baptist's job to go out, prepare people, and explain to them that how you've been raised all of your life with your religion and the law, that, that Jesus is, is fulfilling that but doing something different. Now, John is out baptizing. I want to show you a map really quick of where people feel that uh, John the Baptist could possibly have baptized Jesus or where John the Baptist did baptize people. Uh, you see here there's three different locations. There's one up north uh, called Yardenet, and that's up by the Sea of Galilee. If you ever go to Israel, that's probably where you'll be taken to go get baptized. Uh, it, it seems to be the cleanest water up there. Uh, down towards the Dead Sea, there's two right by each other. There's um, one that's called Yahad and one called El Magdus. And the Yahad is on the Israel side. Magnus is on the Jordan side. I kind of opt for the Jordan side. We, we talked a lot about that in our series in, in the Gospel of John. So if you want to know more about that and see, we have videos of all those different places. We just don't have time to do that here in this, in this particular series. But I always like to show you maps and pictures because I want you to understand that when we read the Bible and study the Bible, these are real places, like real places that Jesus really did walk and where the Jordan River, where, you know, John the Baptist really did baptize people. So anyway, we always do that. But last week we talked about what it means to repent. John the Baptist is like, repent, repent. And um, it doesn't mean remorse or regret. It's not like, oh, I'm so sorry I did that. But then two weeks later, you're going to go back and do it again. It means recognizing your sin, like, ah, that's not conducive of what following Jesus is all about. And then going a different way. Like, I'm not going to do that anymore. So, John comes with this message to this, you know, religious, self-righteous Jewish people, and he says, you need to repent and you need to be baptized. And that was a very, very difficult message for them because I don't think they really understood what that was all about. But John is trying to get them to understand this, that, that if you are baptized, baptism shows those around you that everything from now on will change. That's just what baptism does. It, it, it shows people around us that there's going to be an inward change. There has been, and I want to show everyone that my life is going to change from here on out. I thought this was cute. I used this in our John series. Um, there was a mom, she was watching her seven-year-old get baptized, and uh, she was so proud and in tears, and her son came out of the water, and she said, do you feel any different? And he's like, yeah, I have water up my nose. <laughs> But John's job was to get people ready to meet Jesus, which begs the question for us, what if Jesus showed up to your house? Would you be ready? Author Doug Mendenhall, he shares a brief parable that should cause us all to stop and reflect on what, what, what's in our house. He says this, Jesus called the other day to say he was passing through and wondered if he could spend a day or two with us. I said, sure, love to see you. When will you hit town? I mean, it's Jesus. You know, it's not every day you get the chance to visit with him. It's not like it's your in-laws and you have to stop and decide whether the advantages outweigh you ha you're having to move to the sleeper sofa. That's when Jesus told me he was actually at a convenience store out by the interstate. I must have gotten that Bambi in the headlights look because my wife said, what's wrong? What's wrong? Who is that? So I covered the receiver and said, it's Jesus. He's going to arrive in eight minutes. She ran out of the room and started giving guidance to the kids in that effective way that Marine drills instructors give guidance to recruits. 
my mind was always already racing what needed to be done in the next eight, nope, seven minutes till Jesus would come. So he wouldn't think that we were reprobate loser slobs. I turned off the TV in the den, which was blaring some weird, scary movie I'd been half watching, but I could still hear screams from our bedroom. So I turned off the reality show. It was tuned to. Plus, I turned off the kids' set out on the sun porch because I didn't want to have to explain John and Kate plus eight to Jesus six minutes from now. My wife had already thinned out the magazines that had been accumulating on the coffee table. She put Christianity Today on top for a good impression five minutes to go. I looked out the front window, but the yard actually looked great thanks to my long, hard work, so I let it go. What could I improve in our four minutes anyway? I did notice the mail had come, so I ran out to grab it. Mostly it was Netflix envelopes and a bunch of catalogs tied to recent purchase, so I stuffed it back in, in the box. Jesus doesn't need to get the wrong idea. Three minutes from now, how about how much online shopping we do? I ran back in and picked up a bunch of shoes left at the door, tried to stuff them in the front closet, but it was overflowing with heavy coats and work coats and snow coats and pretty coats and rain coats and extra coats. We live in the South. Why do we buy so many coats? I squeezed the shoes in with two minutes to go. I plumped up sofa pillows. My wife tossed dishes into the sink. I scolded the kids and she shooed the dog. With one minute left, I realized something important. Getting ready for a visit from Jesus is not an eight minute job. And then the doorbell rang. When I read that, it made me laugh because I'm thinking that's what John the Baptist's job was like. Jesus is coming. Let's get ready. So John the Baptist is out in the wilderness preaching and he's not, he doesn't seem very nice. I always say that he wouldn't do very well in our seeker sensitive church culture today. Uh, he was, he was yelling at the Jews. Okay. He was calling out the religious Pharisees, calling them names actually. Um, because I think John the Baptist frustrated. He's like, you've been waiting for your Messiah. You know, the scriptures, you know, the prophecies, you should be ready for this but they weren't. Instead, they become religious and self-righteous. They didn't really need a savior. They felt that they could save themselves just by doing good things or showing up at church or whatever. So John the Baptist comes on the scene and he's trying to prepare this nation of Israel for their Messiah with a message of repentance. They would need to do this first. So John's job is going to be help them understand how far they have gotten from loving this God to working for their salvation. That's what had changed with them. But at this point, John looks frustrated. He looks homeless. The crowds that listening to him are so confused. And the question that the Jews were asking is this, if it's not about us and the law and being descendants of Abraham, then what is it? Like, what are we supposed to do? We pick it up in Luke 3, verse 10. And the crowds were questioning, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said, Collect no more than what you've been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. John the Baptist is trying to say that something has to change inwardly in your life, that your inward change will change to how you act, how you treat people. Last week, we talked about this repentance and fruit. And what John's saying is that what's going to show that you're truly a follower of Jesus is how you act, how you treat people. And he's telling people, like, if you were selfish, yeah, now you have to give things to people in need. If you're a tax collector, well, don't take what isn't yours. If you're a soldier, don't take bribes. Don't use your power in the military to get money for yourselves. In other words, when Jesus comes on the scene and, and you receive him, you give your life to him, you're born again, then everything will be different. It has to. Verse 15 said this. Now, while the people were in a state of expectation and all wondering in their hearts about John as to whether he was the Christ, John answered and said to them, as for me, I'm not Jesus. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not who you're looking for. He said, as for me, I baptize you with water. 
but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And what we begin to see with, with John is that he knew exactly who he was. His job was to promote Jesus, which is always a really good question we should ask ourselves is like, why do I do the things I do? Why do I help others or teach Bible study or work at a shelter? Or, or why am I kind to people? Is it to promote Jesus? Or is it because I want people to look at me and think, oh, you're just a really nice person. See, there's a difference. And John is saying, I'm not here to promote me. I'm here to promote Jesus. And what he says about the sandals is really important. He wants us to understand that there's a huge gap between John the Baptist and Jesus himself. John says he is not even worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus. Now, back in those days, they didn't have like Nike Air tennis shoes or Adidas running shoes or five inch stilettos. They had none of those, okay? They had sandals. And they lived where there was no sidewalks, no asphalt roads, none of that. And so everywhere they walked, it was dirty and dusty, and they'd walk through, you know, animals were walking and would, you know, go to the bathroom, and then people would walk on it. It was kind of disgusting. But if you came to my house, then what I would do is I would have a bowl of water and I would have a servant who would wash your feet because I would think that would be gross, okay? But untying sandals and, and washing feet, uh, they, they were just done by the lowest of the servants. So what John is saying is that I, it's, this is not about me. I'm so low on the totem pole that I'm not even worthy to like wash the feet, to untie the shoes on Jesus's sandals. That's how big of a gap there is between John and Jesus. And John knew that. He knew that his purpose was there to be the forerunner and to promote Jesus to, this, the, to the nation of Israel. So John the Baptist starts telling people that he is baptizing for repentance, but when Jesus comes, everything's going to be different. When you put your faith in him, he is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will now come into your life, will give you the power, the boldness, that what you need to change. In essence, what John is saying is this, look, I can outwardly baptize you. I can show you your sin. I can do a lot externally. But when Jesus shows up and gives you the Holy Spirit, that is what changes you internally. The Holy Spirit within you is what's going to give you the ability to, to love people that you don't really love or, 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 or forgive someone you don't really want to forgive or, or not be fearful anymore. The Holy Spirit is what's going to help you overcome addictions, that's going to give you joy in, in troubled times and give you peace when things fall apart. That is what Jesus will bring when he shows up. But for now, John is just kind of like the opening act. We went to see the comedian John Christ a couple months ago, and he had he, he's so funny and everyone couldn't wait to see him, but he had two comedians open up for him. They were the opening acts before John got there. And I thought that that's what John the Baptist's job is. He's like, I'm the opening act before the main guy comes on, which is going to be Jesus. So he continues telling them, not only will Jesus baptize them with the Holy Spirit, but, but this is what he will also do. Look at verse 17. His winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, this is something that, that, that the people listening to John the Baptist would understand. Agriculture, I mean, they, they understood that back then. And um, here's what it looked like. Uh, wind, willow, sorry, wind winnowing is an agricultural method developed by ancient cultures for separating grain from chaff. It is also used to remove weevils or other pests from stored grain. In its simplest form, it involves throwing the mixture into the air so that the wind blows away the lighter chaff, chaff while the heavier grain falls back down for recovery. Techniques included using a winnowing fan, a shaped basket shaken to raise the chaff, or using a tool, a winnowing fork or shovel on a pile of harvested grain. So what John is doing is he's saying, look, uh, when Jesus gets here, he's going to separate those that, that are, you know, kind of like the wheat from the chaff. And, uh, he, and because the chaff, when it's, when it's thrown in the air, the chaff just is blown away. They were never really true followers. They were never really, they were never really born again is how we would look at it. And today we, there's a lot of, you know, that going on in our churches. There's wheat and there's a parable about wheat and tares. It's kind of like the same weeds, same as wheat and chaff. 
And um, we, we try to explain that just because someone goes to church doesn't actually mean they're truly a Christian. Uh, a Christian is someone who repents, who is born again, something changes, and, and fruit is being produced in their life. And, and, and so let's go back to what chaff looks like, chaff and, and wind. And I want you to see that sometimes when we can tell if we're a Christian by how we respond to these things in life. So think about trials, uh, when bad things happen in your life. Now, if you are like the, the wheat, let's say, the, you're, gonna, you're not going to be blown away. Your faith isn't going to be blown away because of trials, because you're not, you're not chaff. Um, you're, you're wheat. You're, you're, you're strong. You're going to make it through this. Uh, temptations. A lot of people, you know, succumb to temptations and then their faith is like chaff. It's just blown away. Uh, false teaching. False teaching is another thing. When you hear something that conflicts with the word of God, uh, if you believe the false teaching, then it's like chaff. You're going to get blown away. Persecution. I think more and more in this culture, that's what's going to separate us, true Christians with chaff, false Christians. When persecution comes on, are you going to stand for your faith? A lot of people that aren't true believers, it's like chaff. They'll just, they'll just, the, their faith will go by the wayside. Uh, we ask ourselves questions like this. Um, will you stand up for your faith in front of your friends and family or people at work? Because if you don't, then you're going to be considered like the chaff. Uh, will you stand up for your faith if your job requires you to sin or to lie or to cheat or to steal in order to keep your job? Because if you're going to do all those things, then your faith is secondary and you're like the chaff. You're going to just, your faith will blow away. Uh, will you stand up for your faith? Here's some serious persecution. If someone puts a gun to your head. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Like as persecution gets worse and worse, it's going to really separate those, the wheat from the chaff. And Jesus, when he comes on the scene, he's going to make it very clear what it means to follow him. And, and there are difference between the two. So we're going to end today with that thought. So ask yourself this week, am I wheat or am I chaff? Like that's a serious question that we all should ask ourselves because we want to be solid wheat. And that just takes spending time, getting to know God, reading the word, understanding what it actually means to be a true born again follower of Jesus. Hope that helped today. Have a good week.